Now, most, most of your audience would be familiar with the desert. All right, we live in Australia, so, so the three of us have probably either seen a documentary on the desert or we've been there. You know, we, we work in the mining industry. We've been there. You know, what, what do you get when you're in a desert? Um, you know, typically, it's a landscape that looks pretty empty, sandy, dusty, rocky, dead. The desert isn't dead. It's dormant. And right beneath the surface are the seeds of possibility waiting for the right conditions to come about. And when it rains, our deserts burst forth with an abundance of plant life. And, and, I, and I think commerce is a little bit the same. And innovation is a little bit the same. You know, it, it's, I'm starting out with a desert, but when the, 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 the you know, I'm starting out with a whole pile, if you like, of hidden opportunity. But when, when with curiosity I start looking for it and I, the conditions become right or I make the conditions right, there's an abundance. We're living in a time when you have no choice but to innovate. And for many of us, that's as scary as hell. But it can also be the most exciting adventure. For the first time since World War II, we have the opportunity to change everything, to make our world a better place. For those of us in business, that means making your team and customers' worlds better. I'm Judy Selmans, host of the Engage to Innovate podcast, talking all things innovation. So relax, take some time out from your schedule and immerse yourself in the learnings shared by our guests. Today, myself and my co-host, Eric's are talking to Jeffrey Wade. He brings an unusual and valuable mix of qualifications in science, engineering, business administration, cognitive science, and NLP together. That's quite a soup. Plus, more than 30 years commercial experience is giving him a unique perspective on innovation in business. He also works with businesses using a virtual rehearsal technique, which I'm really looking forward to learning more about and how that can help us de-risk our innovations. So welcome to the Engage to Innovate stage, Jeffrey. Good morning. <laughs> Hello there, Judy. You know, we're, we're, we're mutually laughing here because yeah. before we started recording, we were talking about this, you know, is it, is it Jeffrey or is it Jeff? And then, um, of course, you, Jeff, said to me, and so we're going to say Jeff for the rest of this interview now, um, but, but you mentioned that because your mother used to only be the one that only called you Jeffrey, and it rela I related to that because, of course, I'm a Judith, and my mother only ever called me Judith until I had a tantrum one day, and now I get Jude, so... <laughs> It's completely gone mad. Yeah. But anyway, so welcome. Yes. Hi, Jeff. Good morning, Eric. <laughs> Amazing to see all these diversified skills that you've completely taken into, as I said, it's like a real soup of mixture of the, the mind and the science, I guess, is probably one way of combining those mm -hmm. two. So how did you get into innovation from all of that? It's an interesting one. I'll give the answer in, in two pieces in that, I started out with that, that engineering career, but uh, I wound up in leadership, as those of us who, uh, who express an interest in that tend to do. And, and I remember when, um, when that first leadership role was offered to me, um, I was talking to the leader of the company and I said, oh man, I'm going to have to go back to school. And he, he laughed and, and said, really? Tell me more. And I said, well, if I... There are, there are people in this, this team that you want me to lead who've had more years in the company than I've been on planet Earth. Um, I, I need to know how to lead people and to tap into their genius and expertise because they know way more than I do. And, uh, and, and the boss kind of laughed and, and said, okay. And then I said, and I'm also going to have to understand people. And he says, what? I said, I, I need to understand how people know what they know, do what they do. I need to know how to motivate and build a high-performing team. And... The boss just started laughing and he said, do you know why we're offering you the job? And I'm looking at him with this stupid, you know, wet behind the ears expression now. And he said, because of what you just said. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. And, um, so, it, uh, yeah, I, I went back in, into those areas of endeavour and, and funnily enough, for, for a person who started out in engineering um, and, you know, cybernetics and was 
fa- fascinated with with that you know hardcore measurable predictable sort of side of, of life the scientific side and, and that now i'm fascinated with human beings and what i call the predictable unpredictability and mm-hmm. uh, along the way got got really interested in experts and expertise and what yeah what are the differences that make the difference between exceptional performers and competent performers um and you know in getting some postgraduate qualifications in that area of modeling expertise um mm. my career kind of finally took its turn to where it is now where where it's about that's really interesting yeah. and your your early boss was clearly right because i'm sitting here going Oh my goodness! If only more bosses would think like that before taking on a job yeah. um, in a leadership role where they just don't have those empathy skills, which you've clearly developed and blended with the science, which is yeah. which is very cool. Actually, I love that. Yeah, because there are a lot of people in non-engineering environments who, frankly, could use leadership and EQ skills. But doing it in, particularly in your environments, that, that that's quite an achievement. It's it is a characteristic of the field, um, and and you know I'd expend it to other fields. I guess that that we we tend to demonstrate technical competence, and that, and then we get promoted because of that technical competence. And now we're in yeah. a leadership role. And look, half of the leadership role. I never undervalue that there's a management piece, your own manager piece, and that's all, you know, the project management, the business acumen, the commercial stuff. That's half your role. But the other half of your role is people. And and uh, yeah, I, I used to, it, it took me no time to figure out that you know, I'm leading this team, team of, of ten, 10 managers and they're running, you know, a, a bigger team. I kind of stepped into running a, a big team first time around. Um, and it's like, wow! I, I achieved stuff through all these other people. It's, it's the, what I deliver is tiny. The results, yes. the outcome is through my team and their reports. And it's like, I better really get to know these people and make them t- what 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 makes them tick, and you know what what brings them into work and makes them happy here. So um, it was kind of well, that was an yeah, intuitive right. piece. I was lucky that first manager mentored me too. I you know the third thing I said to him was, oh man, you know I'm like 22, 23 years old. How, how am I going to do this without a mentor? At which point he really did just roll on the floor laughing because I, I said, well, who's going to mentor a, a stupid kid like me? Oh. <laughs> and he just said, it's okay, son, I'll do that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's yeah. what, a, what a fantastic way to start. And uh, I really, really, really love that because it's, yeah, so many, you see it in every industry we've ever had anything to do with and, and you know, how do they get their job? It's, been there a long time promoted into the role mm. they're good at what they do technically as you, exactly as you just said but yeah. it doesn't translate into managing a team and I just yeah so that that's pretty cool in itself so I can see I think really that in, an innovation to me is about having an empathy and understanding the emotions does does that make sense? or oh, It totally makes sense. You know, I, if I pull a line from, uh, you know, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, I don't know if you he, he, I think he's a famous figure, but not everyone knows him. Ken is, is, is famous for a, a particular TED talk that he did. He's an educationalist um, and he's got a wicked sense of humour, um, a really wonderful sense of humour that um, comes out in his presentation. But he said... Um, you know, he, he thinks that there are there are three keys to to human um, or three conditions, if you learn, if you like, that need to be satisfied for human beings to flourish. And one of those three keys is uh, creativity. And he, he says, look, human life is inherently creative. Uh, and I'm, it's roughly, he said, I'm paraphrasing him. He said, we, we create and recreate our lives through a restless process of connection with others and imagination. It's, it's this we're constantly inventing and reinventing our lives. And, uh, and I think he, he really, yeah. he had it right. And at, at the heart of you know, that, that feeds, of course, into um, the innovation. But it's fair to say that many people, though, particularly those who, who, who lean more to left-brain thinking, 
tend to see creativity as one of those soft things uh. that may be disposable and that when it comes to the budget crunch is one of those budget lines that will go, first of all, um, you know, to in the interests of keeping the operation going. But as you said, you know, from the Ken, Rob- the Ken Robinson talk, which, by the way, I really enjoyed. I <laughs> remember that talk that it actually is part of life. It's, it's not just a, an option either or. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And look, I, I remember in my, my early corporate career, um, I did, it's, it's interesting what you just said about this, this rule, if you will, or this principle of innovation, new idea, <gasps> risk. Yes. You know, what we've got's working, don't break it. You know, this boat yes. is sailing, it's even keel. You want to mess with the sails? And it's, it's like I, I had that sort of conversation all the time because I remember one of my bosses saying, oh, man, I'm, I'm taking so, – so I, I was at that level of COO and the, and the CEO was my boss, and he, he was taking off to visit the head office in, in the US, and then he was doing some extended, um, some leave, some long service leave. And foolish man, um, you know, had handed the reins to me to look after things while they was gone. <laughs> and we're having this conversation just before he departs, and he said, look, I know when I get back, the company will still be profitable. It will probably be larger. And, and things will be, be running, but, but I just want to know, are we still going to be in this office? And, <laughs> and I looked at him because and and he's, like, he's serious. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you, you bastard, without me to rein you in, when I'm gone, you'll probably double the size of the bloody company and we'll need to be in some new building. You know, if, if we move offices, will you let me know so that when I come back, <laughs> I go. turn up to the right place? <laughs> oh, and, and awesome. It's, and it's, he's, he used to, the other thing he used to say is, he said, you, you're always asking the bloody questions that I, excuse the language, that I don't want, <laughs> you know. It's, it's like, what do yeah. we do this for? Why? And it's, he said, you're always pushing the boundaries. And I said, well, because it's only through new ideas and change that we find the stupidity in what we're doing or, or, and we find better ways <laughs> of doing stuff. And yeah. um, I don't know whether it was because I'm insatiably curious or what, but I, I remember my corporate career, I just naturally had a bent for, yes, innovation has a risk for it and associated with it, but there's greater risk not to. If you... One of my mentors, um, he was talking about human behavior, but I, I expanded it. And he said, look, as, as human beings, we're, we're capable of lifelong learning and lifelong change. This, yeah. this bit that you can't teach an old dog new tricks is, is nonsense. And you know, we were talking about the research in neuroplasticity or the, you know, the, the plastic nature of the brain. In other words, it can reprogram itself, rewire itself, change itself lifelong. Um, yeah. Basically put pay to this, you can't keep teach an old dog new tricks. But he said what happens is people tend to get to a certain point in their life where they're comfortable and they become complacent and it's easy to sit in a groove and not challenge themselves to do new things, learn new things, take on a new language, whatever. Yeah. And um, he was saying essentially they stagnate. And, and as he, he said rather brutally, Jeff, what happens in a stagnant pond? It all dies. Yeah. Right. And he says stagnation yeah. is a form of death. And he, yeah. he says you can, you can die before your time or you can live a life where you're constantly pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And, of course, yeah. every time you do that, the comfort zone expands. But he says when you yeah. do that, you have a pond that's vibrant and full of life and it, it's affecting the environment around it the same way. But if you stagnate... That's a great analogy. Yeah. yeah. But if you yeah. stagnate, you're going to... Well, it's a form of death for you, but not only that, as, as a leader in an organisation, you're dragging down the people around you. It's, it's, I always took leadership as a serious responsibility. It's like, wow, yeah, what I do and what I say has consequences. You know, I'm running a business unit, has consequences for, say, 3,500 people. In fact, you know, when the particular instance I'm thinking of was 3,700 at that time. And then all of our customers as well as the shareholders, and it's like, man, I get up in the morning, this is the responsibility I carry. Uh, and that, 
that was not about making me fearful of change and innovation. If anything, it might have promoted, promoted me to be more open to it, always assessing the risk, but always wanting to try new stuff because when you carry that sort of responsibility, it's about constantly improving. This, this, this you know, the principle of never any continuous improvement um, is, uh, is, I suppose, at the heart of avoid stagnation. So is it fair to say, Jeff, that in the innovation process, there's always a certain amount of failure brought in because you, oh, you yeah. have to experiment. Yeah. So leadership is part of managing it's failure. And that is it fair to say that it's not a negative, it's a positive if, if you learn from it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, t t totally. Um, let me expand with a slightly longer answer to that. Because, because I see there's a couple of pieces there to the question. One, as a leader, yes, you, you, you have a responsibility to foster innovation and encourage people to do it, help them manage the risk. And then there's this piece of when it doesn't work, you want to change their reaction from, oh, it was failure. And, and you know, we, we classify as human right. beings things that don't. You know, I, I set out to get a certain outcome you know, and I miss. Oh, I failed. You know, um, no, you didn't. You learned something. You mm. learned what didn't yeah. work. Now you can either quit or you can try something different. And so, so as a leader, for, for me, it was always fostering that, well, what did we learn? Yep. And, uh, yeah, one of my managers was, was brilliant. He taught me so much. This, this was in my early 30s. And um, we, we were managing a crisis, as you do on occasion. You know, stuff just went <laughs> wrong. The unexpected comes at you from left field. And I've got the team of leaders in the room, and oh, I think there's about eight of us. And we're all in a state of high dungeon. <laughs> it's just, I mean, seriously, you could have videoed it and made a comedy out of it. Um, <laughs> and one of, the guy, one, one of my leadership team is as cool and calm as a cucumber while the rest of us are doing the jitters and <laughs> the whole stress and anxiety thing about how we're going to deal with this. And partway through the meeting, you know, I'm slow to catch on, but about you know, I've been watching this for about 10 minutes as I'm facilitating the meeting. And then I turn to him and say, Tony, um, what is it with you? You're, you're, you're as cool as a cucumber. You're making really useful contributions. The rest of us are stressed to the girls. <laughs> and, and he says, well, you recruited me. What did I used to do before this? And, of course, you know, I stand there feeling like someone's just hit me in the face with a wet kipper. <laughs> It's like, oh, Tony, you used to work in the Navy. Yeah. And he said, what did I do? Uh -huh. And I said, bomb disposal. <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. And, and, he, and he looks at me and the rest of the team and says, is anyone going to die? Exactly. Silence in the room and I say no. Is anyone going to die if we get our response to this wrong? And I look at him and say no. Is the company going to break and fail? if we don't sort this out right the first time? And I say, no. So I said, is all this stress and anxiety going to make any difference? Yeah. And, and there's a long pause before I say no. <laughs> so he says, so what are we doing it for? <laughs> or it was, he says more precisely, what are you and the rest of the team doing it for? He yeah. says, it's going to make no difference to the outcome. Just calm down and let's handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you that 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 was a truly <laughs> compelling lesson. <laughs> it's great when one of your team teaches you something in front of everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> There's nowhere to hide. <laughs> Look, it wasn't about. There's nowhere to hide. It was actually actually was. It's, it's kind of great funny, but it's great yes. fantastic because I clearly took the lesson. Yeah, and it that's taught the key. it taught my team that I was open to feedback and that I could learn. Um, yeah, and, and and funnily enough, the takeaway I got from that experience is that last piece, because um, it did affect their behaviour with me there afterwards. They they kind of believed it beforehand, but when they saw it in action, it was like, wow, you can tell yeah. the boss anything; he'll listen. 
And if there's a lesson in it for him, he'll he'll run with it and change his behaviour. Um, it 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 profoundly impacted in that particular team what what we call psychological safety. Um, and uh, yeah, that's one of the foundations of trust. It, it was yeah. it was this piece of um, you know with and, and I think that's a foundation of innovation too. You, you, your people have yeah. to know that it's safe to do something new, and I won't use that F word, and to learn <laughs> from the consequences yes. when they're not what you yes. want. Um, yeah. But that flies against a lot of traditional thinking and even the way we're brought up. And going back to Sir Ken Robinson, yeah. uh, was he not talking about the education system as well? Oh, he was. It's all about you're either right or wrong yeah. and there's no grey areas. Yeah, and uh, oh, look, he was, he was talking about... Um, it, one, one of the things... I mean, he's got several presentations, but one I, 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 I do... I mean, the audience and I laughed when he says it, but it was like, it was laugh with pain. I actually felt it in the chest and my breathing stopped when he said it, which was, you know, our education system is built on the manufacture date of the children. And, yeah. and he said, it is like a production line where the way we work with the children is dependent upon their manufacture date. And of course, what he was saying is, date of birth dictates how we deal with you mm -hmm. in the system. And he says, yeah. date of birth's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> you know, he went on to explain that it, it, it's the rate of development for each individual, and that's different, yeah. and the, the, the things that motivate interest and stimulate each individual is different. And he says, we just don't take uh, account of that when we're thinking, you know, how it is that we're going to foster creativity in, in, in our children and innovation rather than crush it. Yeah. Oof, you know, even now talking about it, my breathing changes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it seems to me, though, that we've been talking about this for quite some time, as in, you know, people have been talking about the need for creativity in our mm -hmm. education system and all of that sort of stuff. Clearly, that's not a presentation that was given last week. No. So, but, but we don't seem to be embracing it. I mean, the school system hasn't changed. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I had quite a big challenge with my, you know, uh, growing up, in mm. fact, uh, I I went to I changed the whole school system. So I was in New South Wales and went to Queensland. Queensland yeah. didn't know what to do with me. They gave me an IQ test and said, "Oh, you go straight to first, fourth form." Yeah. So I actually missed all the other years because they just did not know what to do with me, yeah. and it caused so many problems later on in life because I never fitted. So I, I, and of course I'm, I have, a, I'm a creative at heart. That's where I come to, that's where I live. That's my mm. comfort place. But I guess where I'm going is that we still haven't changed anything. You we, know, we've we still haven't. got school systems, you know, that just don't work. I, I'll give you a kind of a funny response and a serious response to that. And I, I totally concur. And as someone who's involved with a team of geniuses, um, who truly understand how human beings learn. Um, uh, I, I do get distressed about this on a regular basis. We understand how human beings learn. We're not using that in the school system. And I'll come back and expand on that a little because it, it feeds into the, to the virtual world simulations and how we, we use that okay. in the corporate environment to help people de-risk innovation. But uh, yeah, for the first one, your personal story. Oh, wow, does it not echo mine? I mean, I, I changed countries and, and came into a school system. They didn't know what to do with me. And, oh, we'll, we'll put you down a few years and get you to repeat. And then they read the letter and all the literature that came from from my my previous school and, and my principal. And, you know, they saw the IQ results and all that stuff. And, and then there was the comment to my parents with me sitting there was, oh, my God, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> Mm. And it, mm. it was just bizarre and it's it's uh here's here's the, me the 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 metaphor for you if you will now here's a humorous piece and, and, and a metaphor at the same time that um that that i think puts your experience and mine in perspective and that for a lot of kids uh and and i'll start with just it's a mathematical frame right 
So I'm going to use a word that has multiple meanings. It has a mathematical meaning, but it also has a meaning of you know, social misbehavior. Drop the social misbehavior. We're talking maths here, right? Yep. So I, I remember being described by, by someone as an incurable deviant and daily getting worse. Now, th this particular <laughs> friend was a mathematician, right? So deviant for him was a reference to standard deviations. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, and and essentially he was saying you're 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 a load of standard deviations from the mean, and you're getting worse every day. Uh, that's just you, but we don't know what the hell to do with people who are in that space. <laughs> the, yeah. the, you know what? <laughs> there are a lot of people like that because we tend to think of humans as uh, well, human performance and human capability is conforming to a uh, that that traditional bell curve in mathematics that we all learn in school. But there's more and more evidence coming out, and there was some interesting uh, research done by uh, some, some people um, published in 2011-12. Uh, I know that the two, two researchers were O'Boyle and Aguinas, and um, they found that about 94% of human performance distribution is what we call the long tail. Right. So and that, that's not the bell curve. You know, the bell curve, three standard deviations wide, a, a long tail? It's a different curve, and it's you know kind of think of a Parisian uh, spread. That's that's what it is. We have a, a small number who are just not one, two, or three standard deviations from the mean, but they they can be ten or fifteen standard deviations. And we've seen this in our work with clients. Um, when you look at their exceptional performance, they are so so far from from the mean that it's also it's almost hard to comprehend. And, and the value in an organization in, in, in appreciating that and then going, all right, what are we going to do to move all our core performers, our competent performers in the direction of those exceptional ones? And it's like you're not talking now about moving one standard deviation. Gosh, if we get them in that direction, yeah, we could move them three, four standard deviations. And the, the commercial consequences are huge. But it's 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 also this piece of when you're a few standard deviations from the mean, you encounter experiences like yours in life, where the system doesn't know what to do with you because it's it's pitched for the long tail, which, which mm. you know some people say the lowest common denominator. Well, I don't particularly like that. It's just hey, those people in 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 the in the long tail, they have a load of skills and competencies, but it's just you're not assessing for them in the in the particular yeah. performance distribution that you're looking at. You're you're assessing one set of skills. So there's, yeah, the, yeah, the incurable, I, I, I take an incurable deviant and daily getting worse as a compliment. It's the place to be. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but the, the system so, doesn't so handle it because it's, you know, and, and getting back to the education system, yeah, we're, we're, using, we're using methodologies um, that are really, uh, you know, they're hundreds of years old, where, whereas our recent mm. research is showing us there's, a, there's vastly different ways of learning. And if I can be brutal, some of the consultants, the, the bright people in my team, are education specialists, and and that's their their field of endeavour. And I'll give you two quotes that are really brutal from from one of my team, John, and and he said the education system in Australia is the most expensive child minding form that I've ever seen. Uh, <coughs> Which yes. is like, yeah. And then he said, you know, we did research back in the 70s where we found that um, we could put kids in front of a television with a good, okay, long time ago, television, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with a good teacher presenting a recorded video teaching a topic and we got better learning outcomes than we did in a classroom with a live teacher. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Now we've come a long way since then, you know. We've we've, yes. we've, we've developed, yeah, uh, yeah, out of the University of New South Wales, cognitive load theory, which tells us, you know, how you can break up a topic into bite-sized pieces that build and build and build, and that you can design the way you communicate information to your learning audience in a way that mimics the way the brain takes it on, and you can accelerate learning. We've we've also learned that, um, you know, the best way human beings learn is through trial and error and using what we call the adaptive unconscious. Now, here's a number for you. The adaptive unconscious is about 200,000 times faster at learning stuff than the linear conscious learning techniques we use in the classroom. Hmm. 200,000. That's a massive. That's yeah. massive. Yeah, yeah. And the unconscious is really that. quite powerful. Oh, very much so. 
and and we're not given a um, a, 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 a what what would I call it a user manual. We're not given a mm, user right. manual on how to how to tap into it and how to work with it. And yet, um, it is that the research is starting to show that that is possible. There's so much more neuroscience now around how powerful our unconscious is and how it actually learns and guides us. Oh, yeah. If I can respond to that observation about intuition, to a story and then then a Mm. piece of um, Mm. how you can use it. First thing is, hell yes, listen to it. Um, It is full of wisdom that you don't necessarily appreciate. And... um, as, as I said, we, we model or, or study the structure of expertise in human experience, particularly those who perform well. And some, I have some talents. And, you know, one of them was that, um, or is, that, that I can assess a commercial context very quickly. And, and you know, I'd look at the numbers, read the financial forecast, tell everyone, and I'd, uh, uh, you know, hear from everyone, and I'd kind of just go, yes or no, let's do it. Yep. And... One of my one of my teams says, "I've seen you do this so many times, and it's just like you just have this gut response and know what to do, and you get it right." So, what the hell's going on? I want to I want to unpack the structure of how you do that. Now, of course, you know I'm working with guys who who and, and women who just think that when you demonstrate that behaviour, there's the structure behind it. They unpacked what I did. Now, what's really interesting was I had no idea I was doing this. It was all outside unconscious hmm. awareness. But literally, when I gathered all of the information and I would suck it up and suck it up till I crossed a certain threshold and I had enough to process, um, I, I would get this intuition, that's enough. right? And, mm. and there was a process going on outside conscious awareness that had a particular structure to it and a sequence. It was, it was like when it was unpacked, I'm going, wow, that was clever. Where did I learn that? Mm. And then they unpacked what I did with, with all the information. And, and it was like I had this wall of screens in my head. And in each screen, I was running all the potential scenarios in parallel of, of, of what could unfold with this, with this particular opportunity. And, I, and I'd run hundreds of them. And, and then... Um, I was, you know, rejecting different ways of doing it and, and narrowed it down to a, a small subset that that um, seemed feasible and then, then I'd analyse those in more detail. This is all outside conscious awareness. I had no idea. When they unpacked it, it was like, holy cow, this is genius. But that was what was going. And then after I'd done all of that, I would get this gut yes or a gut no. Mm. And mm. I was only aware of this physical feeling in the center of my torso that said yes or no. But what, what created it was the, the sort of stuff that every human being can do and does, just don't know they do it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and when we when I unpacked how I did it, we, we taught other people in the company to mimic it and, um, and we got consistent results from their decisions using the methodology. So it's kind of, okay. you know, this, this intuition well, let me yep. tell you, intuition is not just a feeling in the gut or the chest or wherever you get it. It is backed up by your unconscious mind doing exceptional processing, parallel processing in great detail. And it's usually based on the, the wisdom and experience that you've accumulated through a lifetime. And, uh, and, and so I, I say, trust your gut. It's interesting, though, because I it's I'm talking slightly personally here mm. and, and uh, from a very young age I have had the ability to listen to what's going on inside my un- my subconscious yeah. and from as young as I can remember I would my mother would just call me stubborn and a pain in the neck <laughs> but I would not do something and it turned out that in fact I even saved someone's life as, as about a 10 year old um, mm. Because I was adamant that I wasn't to get into that car, and it turned out that there was an accident. Had there been another person, that person would have been dead. Um, all those sorts of things yep. have happened, and I, I can, I can't remember a moment that I haven't used it. But I think sometimes I've also used it, and it's been the wrong decision. And I think now my my learnings and understanding of the of intuition is that. If it's coming from a place that's that's panic and fear, uh, then it's the wrong. Then you can still get that intuition, but yep. it can lead you in the wrong direction. Yep, yep. Here's here's a, a, a scientific response. Um, 
we as human beings experience the world through our senses. So we see, we hear, we feel, we taste, we smell, etc. Like, okay, that's how you experience reality, and, and you translate that into language. You, you translate those sensory experiences into language, and then you know, talk to yourself about it, think about it in language. But, oh, you typically think outside conscious awareness in terms of sensory experience. But here's the piece. On the back of each eyeball, you've got about 130 million rods and cones. That 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 uh, you know these are, these are the ends of the the neural pathways that feed back into your optic nerve that are gathering visual input. Right, yeah, 130 million is pretty damn high Huge. resolution. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's marginally better. I joke. It's a, <laughs> than these you know 4K screens. Uh, it's a lot better, and the. And, and if you think about it, you're hearing, um, okay, there's, there's, a, there's a frequency range that you can see in terms of visual, there's a frequency range that you can hear, but the, the, your ears can discriminate an incredible amount of detail. You know, in, in you can move a point source of sound, you know, in, in a large room by a centimetre and your ear can detect that. You know, it can detect mm. spatial stuff as well as all the other things um, it can in here. Breathing and, and uh, you know tonal shifts and all sorts of things when it's when it's listening to a voice, which is often one of the, the more important auditory inputs that you get. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible amount of information that's fed into the brain. Now think about it: do consciously do we carry all of that? No, it's an overwhelm no. for your conscious mind. Yeah. But all that information is in your unconscious. Your unconscious loads up that incredibly high resolution image. It loads up the, the uh, incredibly detailed sounds, but it then samples and just brings to your conscious attention the pieces that it can handle and that your, your unconscious thinks are important and need attention, right? So I bring your attention to the stuff that matters. There's a load of information that is being processed outside conscious awareness and never brought to conscious awareness. But if it's being processed outside conscious awareness, your unconscious that's processing that has got a load more information about what it's seeing and hearing than your conscious is aware of. And right. often your intuition comes from the processing of that far more detailed information outside conscious awareness, hmm. which is one of the reasons why I say tap into it. But uh, as you say, um, sometimes when you're in a, in a when, when your response is, is very much about preservation of life, if you will, you know, that flight or flight sort of fear mm. response. Mm. Well, w when you go there, then the brain is in a different form uh, or, or a different mode of functioning. And um, your breathing, your blood chemistry, all sorts of stuff changes and the way you process information changes. So in, in that instance, it's very much about the instant judgment. Um, snake, uh, jump in the air, spin, and then yeah. run without your feet touching the ground. I don't know quite how you do it, but you can run through the air. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. But it, it, and then afterwards you think, oh, wow, yes, okay, that was a diamond python harm us, but too, too late. I'm, you know, <laughs> the, the, the response is danger. I'm out of here. Um, yeah. Because in some instances, the, the, that assessment is totally correct and your life could be on the line. Mm. So as part of the innovation and creativity process, is it fair to say then by being open to these different things that, that, that occur to you both consciously and unconsciously, that it really helps to, to leave it open? Oh, it does. Look, there's, uh, a, there's a process for innovation the, and, and creativity that you can learn and mimic from, from you know, modeling people who are really good at it. But one of the things that we often teach, uh, I mean, this, this is a funny one, I suppose, because you know, I, I work in the corporate space. Hmm. Let me tell you that uh, we, we very often when we're working with leaders, we teach them how to calibrate in other words, how to recognize their intuition signals. We teach them three right. to recognize, right? But most people are mm. getting these signals lifelong, but as I said, didn't get the user manual. Yeah. So I weren't taught what it is, how it is, or how it is experienced and or, or, or how to use it. So we say to them, well, you're, you're getting these signals from your, your unconscious all the time, but, but let's hone the way you work with them. So the signals that, that are most useful, all you need are three signals. Yes. No, 
and I need more information, or if you like, I don't know. Because with, right. with those signals and closed questions, you can start talking to your unconscious. You can tap into it because you think about yep. it, you know, internal dialogue on your head. Hey, Jeff's unconscious. Yes. Um, uh, the outcome I want to achieve is this in this particular context. Now, um, first question, I suppose, uh, from, from, from my unconscious, yeah, are there any parts in there that object or have concerns? And, and you get this sensation in your body that you've calibrated is yes. And it's like, oh, yeah. okay, I thought it was a brilliant idea. There's an, there's an objection. My unconscious is seeing something that I've missed. All right. right. And, then, and then you can take it further and you can actually, well, when, when you know how to, to talk with, the, with, your, with your unconscious using that simple set of closed questions, you actually tap in and find out what the objection is. Or you can ask your unconscious to bring to bear the resources that, that are necessary and sufficient to a sufficiently, you know, to, to manage that objection, to handle it so it's not a, a problem anymore and that the and then that the outcome that you're framing um, is one that you can safely pr pr pursue. And by, by safely, I mean, you know, I, I get my outcome, but I don't break the system in which I'm operating. Hmm. So the, the need for more information, which is a much better way of putting it than, mm. than, than I don't know. Yeah. Um, lead, I think, connects well with being curious. Oh, yeah. That good innovators are curious. You, you brought that up earlier. Mm. And I, I'm personally, I'm a great believer in that, that as, as part of this, the, the more curious you are, particularly if you step outside of your industry, I think, that if you're at that third stage, your subconscious says, you know, I, I, I just need more information. Yep. That is it fair to say then the more you take in, the better, the, the, and the more, more diverse it is, the better the outcome. Yeah. And, and look, as you're taking in the information, you're, you will get to a point where you realize or you, or you get a sensation that says, I have enough now to make an informed yep. decision. Right. There's, there's a trade off. Like, I can go after every single piece of information I need and crank right. the risk right down, but you'd never make a decision. You'd be hunting for information forever. One of the things that, you know, that, that, that for me um, differentiates or classifies those who have business acumen is they're able to get a, a set of information which is not 100%. And right. it's enough for them to make an astute and accurate commercial decision and then act on it and manage it to success. Yeah. Uh, yeah and it's, um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, um, you know, most, most of your audience would be familiar with a desert. All right, we live in Australia, so, so the three of us have probably either <laughs> seen a documentary on the desert or we've been there. You know, we, we work been in there. the mining industry, yeah. we've been there. You know, what, what do you get when you're in a desert? Um, you know, typically, it's a landscape that looks pretty empty, sandy, dusty, rocky dead yeah the desert isn't dead it's alive it's dormant <laughs> yeah yeah and right beneath the surface are the seeds of possibility waiting for the right conditions to come about and when it rains it. our deserts burst forth with an abundance of plant life and and I, and I think commerce is a little bit the same and innovation is a little bit the same you know it, it's I'm starting out with a desert, but when the, 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 the you know, I'm starting out with a whole pile, if you like, of hidden opportunity. But when, yes, when with curiosity, yeah, I it. start looking for it and I, the conditions become right or I make the conditions right, there's an abundance. And that, that for me is part of innovation and creativity. It's, it's, it's seeing the opportunity where everyone else is seeing desert. Yeah. And is that something that, can be cultivated. I guess. Like if someone says, look, I'm not a naturally creative person. I, I, I just don't know where to start with this. Yeah. yeah any, any, any tips on how you oh, look, do that? Structure of experience. Uh, yeah, um, when, when you look at uh, what creative people do, um, that, that there's, a, there's a lot, a, a raft of different things, but um I'll suggest two that are useful. Yep. Number one is um, relates to your state, right? Um, and by that, I mean your mental and physiological state. Right. Uh, and 
we've most of your audience would have heard of uh, I think being in flow. There's there's mm-hmm. a there's a famous uh, researcher in the US and uh, author. Um, his name is Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, High, and don't don't ask me to spell that because I tell you it bears no relationship to the way you spell it uh, and the way you pronounce it. But but Mihaly is famous for doing uh, research in this space and. Um, he talks about the structure of flow or flow states, or another way to think of flow is, is much like being in the zone. You know, for, for the golfers right. who are in your audience, you know, there's always been that day when you went out and you just played par and birdie and yes. maybe the odd eagle. <laughs> and it may not have been the whole game for the day, but you, yes. you did it on enough holes. You nailed it. Yeah, yes, you know, I'm, those I'm shots. coming back for this because that's what it's all about, right? That's flow. Yeah. It's that state that you're in when you do the genius performance, the exceptional. Um, and it has a structure. And, and the structure right. is full-blown external attention with wide peripheral vision. It's silent internal dialogue. It's in, in, in your physiology, your, your body, it's, it's relaxed musculature, uh, but, but enough to you know, keep you erect and comfortable. There's, there's even breathing. There's all sorts of uh, characteristics, you know, I could rattle on and talk talk about more, but the first piece is get that state. And you yes. can do that because, uh, look, there, there are games, there are exercises, there are activities that create that state. And, um, you know, if, if, if anyone's really interested, um, you know, that they, they can contact you or me and I'll, and I'll, I'll give them some, some literature on one or two of those games that they can play. It will create a flow state for them. Okay. That'd be terrific. Uh, so, so that that's one, um, and then then the other is there. There's this process, this structure to there are there are thinking strategies that that creative people follow, and 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 kind of one is um, they mess around when they're thinking about stuff with with different logical levels. So if um, you know the, I, I suppose. Some people might know of the work of De Bono, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, he talks about lateral thinking and, and, and stuff like that, abductive thinking. So, so you know, we, we know, you know deductive thinking, <laughs> inductive thinking, abductive thinking, right? right? They're, they're, they're processes. Yeah. And uh, playing with abductive thinking, uh, you know, I was talking about logical levels. Um, what happens there is... Probably the simplest e- example is I might start out and I'm thinking about a particular Stradivarius violin, you know, and it's got a name. And, and then I can chunk up to a slightly higher logical level and say, well, you know, that's the group of violins. It belongs to the family of violins. So I've expanded the, you know, the member group but also what I'm thinking about. I can chunk up a little further and say, well, it's a member of the, the group of instruments the, where, where you pull a bow across the strings to make sound. And then I can chunk up further and say, well, it's a member of the group of, of, of instruments where you, where you use strings to, to create the music. And that now suddenly you think about, oh, hold on, now I'm including pianos. Mm. And I can chunk up and chunk up till it's like, well, you know, anything that makes sound. Right. When you chunk up to those higher levels, you just keep expanding the scope wider and wider and wider. And when you do that, suddenly it makes accessing the new ideas so much easier. And, that, and that's what I call it, yeah. Creative people, innovative people start chunking up to higher logical levels and they expand the scope of their thinking and the, and the members of the group that they're thinking about when they're dealing with a particular problem or trying to innovate or create a solution. And that's when they start because- yeah, doing that, yeah, um, yeah, you know, lateral thinking stuff. The, the the creative. Hey, where the hell did that connection come from? <laughs> yes, and that would help you step out of your industry as well, because oh, yeah. so many industries have their own conventions, which everybody mm. and your competitors, you all get to know each other and go round and round in circles. Yep. Whereas, you know, particularly in these recent ages of innovative disruption, someone standing outside of your industry sees a bigger picture, as you say, as you've yeah. chunked it up mm. and, and makes a connection that in, in, inside your club you don't see. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and, and that's how we got into some of our, our work in, in innovation with, with the virtual worlds. One of the, the geniuses that I work with, yeah, a lady um, 
Dr. Leah DeBello, who's, who's based in San Diego in the US. Uh, she started her research in, in her postgraduate studies at, at university. And she was, she was interested in how you accelerate change in organizations, which, if, if you will, is a, you know, a, a form of innovation and how you could tap into workplace expertise to do that. And out of her her research, ultimately came this this concept of oh well you know one of the things that most organisations struggle with is they get innovation as mandatory. Uh, I mean, in, in in the world where we have this incredible rate of change, you know, if if you're not adapting, if you're not seeing the change, I mean, you've got to be aware of it. You've got to adapt, I and mean, if you're not learning from your mistakes and what's going on, you're doomed. And and in fact, there's a great yeah. There's a great book on the on the study of military failures, and um, and it talks about those three categories of error that people make in terms of not noticing what's happening, not adapting, and not learning. And they said any one mistake in any one area, and um, okay, you'll have problems, but you'll be okay. Mistake in mm-hmm. two areas, it's getting catastrophic. Mistake in three areas, that's the end. You're out. You're right. You're a Nokia. You're a Kodak. You're, you're one of these abysmal uh, military disasters. And, um, and, and business tends to be the same. And so at the heart of those three things uh, is, is this, this element of, you know, notice what's going on and adapt, innovate, learn. And, but it's got risk associated with it because a, lo- a lot of organizations, they see, well, when I innovate and I try something new, um, it could work. Yeah. It yes. might fail and cost a whole lot of money. It might absolutely implode and break the company. And so there's fear. Yeah. And um, and that, of course, fear, you, you, we were talking about that right back at the beginning, yeah. how, how it, uh, it impacts the way we think and behave. Um, it just kills innovation. And yeah. so out, out of Leah's work, you know, we partner with her. Um, I met her a number of years ago. I was um, just fascinated with what she was doing and then <laughs> said, hey, can we work together? And um, foolish earth person that she was, uh, I think she was <laughs> she was <laughs> captivated by my incredible th- enthusiasm for her work and what she was doing. She said, sure. <laughs> and, and I, think, I think she said something along the lines of, you're one of the few people who also has instantly understood what it is, how it works and why it works. <laughs> I, I caught her off balance and, and in a weak moment she, she agreed to work with us. I'm so, so grateful for that. Um, but her, her work is building, uh, as nowadays has, has migrated to, the, they build or we do it together, we build virtual environments, right? Well, you call it a virtual world if you like, but it's a mimic of the mm-hmm. real world. And in that virtual environment is your business, your client base, you know, the, the, the city or the mine or the factory or whatever that you're in. But it's a, it's a mimic of all the commercial models of the world as well and the constraints in your business. And um, what what happens is you can put teams of people into that virtual world now, we speed time up so they don't spend years in there, but, but they'll spend, you know, eight, maybe 10 hours over a couple of weeks in this virtual world, and that will be the equivalent of two to four years real-world experience. Oh, and, right. and then they can muck about in the virtual world and try new ideas. Wow. So they, they experiment, and what happens with the new ideas that they try in the virtual world, because we made an exact mimic of the real world, it's the same thing that will happen in the world. And they, they basically iteratively fail their way to great innovations and success. And, and as we say, you know, the failure in the virtual world costs nothing, or at least you know, it, it, the cost is virtual. It's electronic. <laughs> and, uh, but the learning is real. And if, and if I can give a, 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 an interesting example, you know, I've, I've talked about it commercially, but I, I can also talk about it for, as, as um, an example of why the learning works and the, and the form of the learning. When, when people get into these virtual worlds, they're sufficiently real that after five or ten minutes there, they forget that they're in a virtual world. They think they're in the real world, right? And, mm-hmm. you, the, the, one of the funny examples of that is you know, the big underground mine um, that, we, that we built for a client and then some of the execs came in to have a look and they jumped in the virtual world and after they'd been in there for five minutes, right? This is a huge underground mine. One of the execs realizes that he's lost and he starts 
panicking. <laughs> oh, goodness. Like, just literally. But he's still shaking a pot, turning white. I'm lost. How do I get out of here? <laughs> and we started laughing. He mate, you hit the escape key. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Right. That's so, yes. yeah. so you can get it's, wow. it's that real that, that people now take it for, for the real world and so the experiences that they have in the virtual world have the same sort of learning as as, as you get in the real world too and um you know another story sticking with the mining thing one 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 mine that we uh, we, we built um we talked about doing some safety stuff at the same time the project was about increasing the throughput in the mine and therefore increasing the value substantially. But we wove in some safety stuff. And, and, and we put these hazards everywhere that, that they might normally ignore, but we're tracking when they ignore the hazards and, and, and giving them feedback about that. And then we also threw some curveballs at them. You know, you, you, you can create stuff. Um, there's an event generator in the virtual world that allows you to do all sorts of interesting things, black swans, as we call them. So, you know, right. we could hit them with seismic events and fires and things like that, that just rare. And we did. 25-year seasoned veteran miners who really know their stuff. Huh. Half of the workforce died because they thought they knew how to get out of the mine but they didn't get it right. And, and, and you know, in, in the fire instance, you know, there's only 20 minutes of air in their rebreather and they were running out of air and dying in the virtual world. These poor bastards. Because, you know, when they died in the virtual world, we'd have them go into the light. <laughs> yeah. But they, they were sitting there white, sheet white and shaking. Yeah. As if they'd had a real-world death experience. It profoundly changed the way they operated. Yeah. And, and that's uh, actually and fascinating. We went back years later and, uh, you know, and the, you, we rock in and the miners bounce up to us and say, oh, we remember you. Yes, you, know, <laughs> you killed us. You yeah, right. yeah. the black swan. <laughs> yeah, but here's, here's the thing that was the, the, the cruncher. You, know? you totally changed the way I behave at work. Oh, really? Tell mm. me more. Every day when I turn up now, I look at where I'm working. And on the way to work, I'm looking for all the hazards and I'm identifying. I'm identifying the exit routes. I think about if this goes wrong, what would I do if that goes wrong? Mm. And then the two to five minutes before I start work, I've thought all of that stuff through. And I've done that every day since I had that experience in your virtual world. I never did it in the 20 on years before. Now that's behavior certainly... change, and that's life saving behavior change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I you, certainly you... recommend anyone having a look at the the WTRI website, oh, yeah. uh, which I was having a look through the images you have there. Some of the screenshots mm. of, of the world uh, are quite striking, and there is one of a fire in the mine. I, yeah. I, I think it is, and uh, yeah, no, I, I, I can see how you would get immersed in that. Oh, you know? What I was also in, interested in, uh, you mentioned as, <laughs> as part of your, your background as to what this virtual world rehearsal approach can do, uh, I was very keen, for one thing, that it, about uncovering innate talent. Yep. Very interested in that. So you find when, so how does that work? Look, when, okay, <laughs> Here's, a, here's an extra piece of information. Yeah, oh, virtual world. Yes. So yeah, everyone's thinking, yeah, they but they, they, they build a virtual world. It's like a game. Da 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 da. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. That mindset says you're thinking a bunch of gamers, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> yep. or, 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 or IT people build a virtual world. Hell yes, they do. Thank you very much. They're brilliant. They're geniuses. But we put with them industry experts who are building right. their commercial models. We put in you know, other, other consultants who are helping build all of that, that reality mimic of the commercial virtual world. Part of the team is cognitive scientists. What? <laughs> You're building a virtual <laughs> world for business? A bunch of cognitive scientists? Yes. <laughs> because, because you know, when we build these virtual worlds, part of the idea is that it, it's almost where we're wanting to reprogram the brains of the people who go into the virtual worlds. We're wanting to break down some of the limiting paradigms and beliefs and mindsets that they've got and help them get courageous and, and risk and experiment with new ideas in the virtual world. 
So, so when, when that sort of thing's going on, we're also wanting to measure how people are interacting in the virtual world and what that's telling us about how they're thinking, how they're making decisions, the sorts of decisions they're making and how quickly. So there's all sorts of stuff that's in there that tracks that. And we're able to do fairly astute analysis of the individuals and, uh, you know, where they're at and how they're changing as they go through the experiences in the virtual world. Hmm. So, um, yes, uh, th that allows us to assess, you know, um, for example, uh, yeah, we, we, can, we, we have uh, variations that are designed specifically around assessing the business acumen of senior executives. We throw senior executives in, and we give them a, a you know a, a, a problem in a business, and then and then see how they try and solve it. And that tells us a load about their leadership style and their business acumen and their thinking strategies and where their strengths are that they can leverage in the future and where they might want to focus to develop and and be more resilient, more resourceful individuals for corporation that they that they're operating hmm. in. So That's powerful stuff. There's yeah. much richer information than the standard personality test, oh, yeah. which Look, I personally dislike. No, I, I really, do too. really, really. And, yeah. and, if, and if Leah was here, she, she'd, be, she'd be standing on her platform and I'd be up there with her <laughs> and we'd be venting <laughs> a little bit about them. Look, the personality profiles have their place, but as, mm. as, yeah. as the research the, that has been done is that if you really want to understand how a person thinks and behaves, then you measure them and observe them while they're solving a problem. And the, the profiles, you know, the personality profiles and psych profiles and stuff don't do that. The, the, no. Because there is an element of, you know, when you're assessing a person, the way they behave is, as, as I say, it's context related. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, and, and if I can give the simple example for, for the audience, you know, you, you do these profile tests and, and, and you get a question like, you know, would you rather go for a run or eat an ice cream? You know, and, some, and most people are just going to, okay, I'll pick one and move on. Me, I go. Uh, well, also uh, what's socially acceptable. Yeah, yeah, well. but, but there's me, I, you know, I, I get that. And I'm raising my hand saying, um, I need more information. And, right. and it's like, well, what do you need more information for? Well, it depends. What do you mean it depends? Well, if, if you know, I was in Canberra on a winter's morning and stepping out from my <laughs> hotel room into the minus six degrees, I can tell you an ice cream will not cut it, nor will a yeah. run, no. <laughs> because I did that once. And, and I remember the concierge of the hotel looking at me as though I was a lunatic as I went out Very to go strange. for a run. Yes. And about two minutes later, I came back and smiled at him and said, now I know why you gave me that look. Right? Yes. <laughs> but, you know, and then, you know, put me on a hot summer's day and go for a run. Yeah, you know, a Brisbane day where we live, let's, let's, let's pick one of yeah. these 35 degree C summer days. Am I going to go for a run in the middle of the day? No. And would I have a cold ice cream? And I don't normally think that, I don't like ice cream that much, right? But I'd have a cold ice cream then. And, and then you put me in another yeah. context, the answer is going to be different. So how the hell can you assess anything from the answer I give with quite some questions where the response is entirely dependent upon the context? You've actually made me feel quite normal, Jeff. Thank you. Because every time I've done one of those things and there are a variety of people who have presented them to me and said, oh, I need you to fill out this. And I keep going, yeah, but it depends. And I want to yeah. write an essay. Yeah. And I keep right. going. <laughs> and, and so I never, ever fit. I just go, well, maybe, maybe yeah. I have to pick one. So I know that's full normal. well. And the results never come out yeah. me. Mm. So that's why. That really helps actually made me feel a little more sane because I always often think I'm on a different planet. No, you're a human being. And, you know, one, one of the things that, that um, my team laugh about that I sometimes say is, is, is these profiling tools, they're trying to put you in four boxes or 16 boxes or whatever, right? There's, I can't remember the number, but I think it's like 7 billion people on the planet at the moment. Mm. Mm. There are 7 billion boxes, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that comes back to one of, you know, it takes me back to Sir Ken Robinson. Yeah, one, one of the other things that he said is wonderful about human beings is we're naturally different and diverse. People are different. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of, yeah, I, I think I remember in, in his presentation, he's always got a bit of humour. He's talking to an audience and he says, you yeah, know, look at the person to the left of you, right? Look at the person to the right of you. 
Yeah. You're not going to confuse them, are you? You're not going to go around saying, now, which one were you? Remind me. And he said, yes. but appearance is only one dimension exactly. of difference. And human beings prosper with diversity. Sometimes yeah. it's just easier to let go the profiling and deal with the person who's in front of you, their unique and wonderful attributes. Mm. And that's one of the yeah, things I've learned about one. leadership. Yeah, it's, it's contextual yeah, awesome. and it's individual. It. Yes. Mm. And, and, and just quickly to say that uh, what sparks in my mind here is that embarking on an innovation project, no matter how large or small in a team, mm. seems quite beneficial because you do bring out other dimensions to people that, oh, yeah. you know, they may have been pigeonholed in some way, but mm. to actually see people wrestling with a problem, um, I, I can see why you say in, in your background info about the, these benefits of of, of doing an exercise that, uh, along with the creativity and problem solving, and mm. just how people a- approach things, because you never know. Well, you know, never people know. bring, and yeah. The commercial yeah. consequences are profound. Um, right. Now, when we do these virtual world projects, um, let me give you some examples. Um, right. One organization. It, it quadrupled the value of the mine. So the outcome was measured in billions, right? It more than doubled the throughput oh, without, without spending much. Uh, they found they were managing the wrong constraint. You know, I, I take another example, um, uh, what, what we jokingly call the lastchance.com example. You know, some of the clients who come to us, are uh, they're literally on the burning platform at the edge of the precipice and they're going, um, we're so desperate, we've tried everything else, we've spent gazillions with all these different consultants. Mm. You mad bastard can cognitive scientists with your virtual world, you know, we'll give that a go. There's no, nice. you know, we're desperate. And they go from literally yeah, yeah, the bank is about to uh, wind up the company to um, 90 days later they're making healthy profits and they've recovered. And a year later, the company is in acquisition mode and buying others to cope with the growth. Huh. Wow, that's a, absolutely um, you know, an, a testament. A, yeah, another one where you know, doubled market capitalization, or in other words, the share price in one year. Um, yep. I, and I could go on with, with examples like that. We, we, we tend to talk about the, the, the potential that comes from rehearsal around innovation as, uh, look, unless you... Um, you want uh, something more than 100% improvement, don't, don't talk to us because the numbers yeah. are all 100% and above. Uh, you, you've actually got to be courageous enough to want that sort of change. And we, we call those, that's why we call those projects performance transformation because yeah. it's those, that's what comes from innovation. It's not a 5% shift. It's not a 20% shift. Start thinking 100% and more within a year. Um, right. yeah, probably my favourite was one with New York City Transit Authority. And, um, you know, Leah did this project. And it was almost, you know, a dare in that they tried nice. to drive this really critical change six times previously and failed. And the industry average success rate for this sort of project was 30%. It was 70% failure rate. And failure was measured as <laughs> take all the kit and the software and the systems and give them back to the vendor and walk away. And mm-hmm. the last piece of that was that the typical uh, project time from start to implementation success was 18 months. Leah used this methodology of hers and they had a successful project in six weeks. My oh, goodness. I know. It, it, it was, it's written up in the literature. And it became a famous case study, but it was taken on as a dare. <laughs> and, and it's, for, me, it's probably, <laughs> for me, it's probably the most profound testament to, to how this stuff works because it was a highly unionized highly religious, rigid and highly resistant to change environment and, you know, one that was already sceptical because six times they'd tried and it had failed. It tells you what's possible. 
Yeah. So I, you know, because uh, we we do need to wrap this yeah. up, but I would really <laughs> like to, um, I'd like to find, you know, obviously your examples are, you know, pretty much bigger bigger industries. Um, so what I, you know, are there take homes that you know a smaller you know, smaller business group or someone even, yeah. you know, maybe not two, totally two, starting two, out, but can we use your system to in a smaller way? Oh, yeah. Look, there's two pieces to, to that. Yes, um, the customised versions that we or virtual worlds that we build are for the big green of town. Right. And and they, they deliver hundreds and hundreds of millions of value to the to the clients, and so for them it's it, it's it's easy to yeah. go through the project and and have a custom world built, and and for them also the other benefit is you know they solve one problem and then they get in the virtual world and solve the next and the next and the next. Right. But we've started building generic virtual worlds, and mm. uh, you know you want to build an agile organization. We have one where you can throw your people in, and it will teach them how to divert, well, it wasn't teach them, it literally trend, it, it rewires them to behave and think and, and make stra uh, you know, decisions with, with an agile culture. You can build an agile culture in the organisation. We've got a generic mining and merger and acquisition and things. And so, yeah, when we talk the generic solution, you, you're starting to talk two and a half grand per seat, not, okay. you know, which is totally affordable for almost anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And we are going to build more and more virtual worlds. Um, we, we have about half a dozen at the moment, but we're, uh, you will get industry-specific and context-specific virtual worlds. Um, and then, then I guess, uh, you know, the, the other option is um, come talk to us about your specific situation and maybe the solution that, that we've got for you is not a virtual world, but it's one that will... Um, for example, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, we teach people how to tap into their intuition. It may be yeah. something like that where there is an intervention that changes the culture in the organisation and then as a, as, as a consequence you can build innovation in. Now, when I say change culture, if I can leave you with one last um, break the prevailing paradigms, it seems to be my, <laughs> my habit, um, yeah, the, the, out there we think that change culture in an organisation is something that takes a long time. Um, you know, I, I remember when the head of National Australia Bank um, made his comment, and I, you know, I don't mean to single him out, but, but he made a comment after the banking um, inquiry here, commission. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, we, we have to change, but you know, we're a big organisation and it's really slow and it'll take a long time. And my yeah. instant response was, yeah, the mistake the bank is making is that they didn't fire you five minutes after you said that because you just gave 30,000 people permission not to change. Yeah. And, and I know you did that because you came from a belief, a mindset and an experience that culture change is slow, but it ain't. We've changed it mm. in big organisations from one day to the next. You just mm. have to know how to do it. And, and, you and know, be open to it. Yeah. And, 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 understand and be, people. <laughs> you have to understand people. And the way you do it is different. You know, uh, the, yeah. you do an intervention that, that doesn't have people standing up saying the culture's changed. You do an intervention where people see the culture's changed. Mm. And one of my, my favourite stories was, you know, an organisation where, where um, you know, the culture was sweep the bad news under the carpet because the boss murders the messenger. Yeah. To change the culture in that organisation because it was costly. You know, the boss would hear about the bad news when it was just too late and too expensive. Yeah. We did some work with the boss, changed the way the boss behaved. And then mm -hmm. the cultural intervention was they pulled the 680 or whatever staff it was together in, in a uh, conference facility uh, at 5.30 after work one day. And they're all standing there. They had no idea why they were there. And then in walks the boss and he's holding a skill saw. In walks the executive team behind him and they're holding a couple of trestles and the oak right. doors from the CEO's office. Oh, he plugs wow. in the skill saw, they slam the doors on the trestles and he just starts carving these door up into pieces that, you know, a couple of centimetres square. 680 people are in <laughs> shock. <laughs> he and, and his team pick up the pieces of wood from these doors and just walk out into the audience and hand out pieces of wood. Turn around, oh, unplug wow. the skill saw, walk out, pick up the trestles, walk out. 
Oh, and then the wow. hotel How cleaners. How powerful is that? that? Is the hotel cleaners come in and start to clean up, and everyone realizes yes. the event's <laughs> over. The next day, wow. the CEO said the next day at about you know, 10 o'clock, someone stood at his door nervously, or at least where the door used to be, because this mm. is just an open space, and held up a piece of wood. And he invited them in, and they told him about a problem. Now, he behaved totally differently. And mm. he got all the information and they worked out how to solve the problem. And he thanked that employee so much for coming in and sharing the problem with him early so that it could be solved before it became costly. Yeah. Yeah. And he said Fantastic. within half an hour, the grapevine had done the rest. And he said <laughs> that one change increased their profit by 8% in nine months. <laughs> all he had to do was lose a couple of oak doors. Yep. But you get the idea that, that that's the story yes. is about we Fantastic. think that you do culture change by telling people about it. You don't. There are, there are metaphorical ways of doing culture change that are far more effective and can change the culture in days. Absolutely fantastic. You know, I have really enjoyed this, Jeff. I have to be honest. I, I um, you know, it's been quite enlightening for me. I love learning and to me this has just been a great learning experience. And we will put links, of course, to your website and how people can get in touch with you. But Thanks. but tell those who are too lazy to click on the link. Yeah, and I'll also send you that document that I promised, which will yeah, describe awesome. for people how they can do an exercise they'll build on the flow state. It's a lot of fun. Fantastic. Really worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So what is what is your website address? Just if you give that to us just for those who are too lazy to find the link. Okay. And um, they want to uh, write it down. <laughs> so the the company is um uh, Oniric, which is spelled O N I R I K and then it's dot com dot au. Very much appreciate yes. that. That was in, as I said, enlightening and uh I have no oh, doubt. Mind opening. Mind, well, yes, mind opening. <laughs> <laughs> the, con the subconscious is buzzing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the okay. opportunity and um, to the audience who's listening. Thank you. I hope there was something useful that you could take away. I'm sure there will be. Yeah. <laughs> thank Thanks, you, Jeff. Jeff. Ciao.